This podcast is being brought to you in part by the veteran-founded Hero Soap Company, located in Phoenix, Arizona. In today's environment, we must be aware of the products we apply to our skin. As a two-time cancer survivor, I cannot afford to take chances, and I use these products myself. The soaps will leave you feeling clean and refreshed. All the products made by the Hero Soap Company are made in the United States with the highest quality ingredients sourced from companies in the United States whenever possible. The products are made in small batches to ensure high quality and contain premium essential oils and fragrance. All Hero Soaps are created without synthetic colorants, parabens, and sulfates that are irritating to the eyes, skin, mouth, and lungs and are cruelty-free, meaning these products are not tested on animals. Each 5-ounce bar of soap is handmade in Phoenix, Arizona, and the body wash is available in 8 ounces with such refreshing scents as the woods, tea tree, lavender, the fields, bourbon, lime, the pines, and arctic. You will absolutely love this soap. Please also check out their gear for sale. All the products are reasonably priced. Being veteran-founded, the company understands the dedication and sacrifice that each family makes to serve their country. A portion of sales is donated back to charities that are focused on helping veterans and our first responders. Over 1,200 bars have been sent to our deployed troops. Please check out their website, HeroSoapCompany.com, for pricing and a detailed description of all the products. When ordering, use the code RAP for a 10% discount. The company information will be listed in the podcast notes and featured on the podcast website, Facebook group, page, and the podcast Instagram. Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport, two-time male breast cancer survivor and full-time lymphedema thriver. Before we start, I would like to thank all of our listeners, sponsors, and supporters that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all the provinces of Canada, and over 45 countries around the world. The podcast has just been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts from thousands of podcasts on the web in that category, and is ranked by traffic, social media followers, domain authority, and content freshness. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Eric Hale. Eric, who is a non-smoker, was diagnosed in 2013 with stage 3A lung cancer at the age of 30. In that year, Eric underwent radiation, chemotherapy, and a lobectomy, which consisted of removing one half of his left lung. After another recurrence in surgery in 2019, Eric is now healthy and enjoying life with his wife and young son, and his family is expecting another boy on the way soon. Eric is also a first-time author, and his book entitled All the Brittle Pieces is now available. Eric actively advocates for lung cancer awareness. He is here today to share his story. Welcome, Eric, to the podcast. Hey, Ron. Thanks so much for having me. It's uh, it's really great to be here, and I, I really appreciate it. Glad to have you. Eric, would you please share your background with us? Uh, what was your life like before age 30 when you were diagnosed with lung cancer? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I was just a normal, active 30-year-old. Um, I went to the gym all the time, pretty much every day. If, if not, you know, I'd skip the weekend sometimes, but I was always weightlifting and running and very healthy and active, tried to stay on a good diet nutrition plan. Um, at the time, I was a preschool teacher living in Berkeley, California, so very active also with young kids. Uh, 
the kids in my classroom at that time were three and four years old. So I loved it, but you got to have a lot of energy to do it too. Which yeah, is for why sure. Work, yeah. The working out helped with that. Yeah. Um, but just, just normal, you know, going, going to the movies with friends and just uh, going out to dinner with friends and, you know, just enjoying life. And the thing that really started to happen was I, I started to get um, winded during my workouts and I've always had asthma. So I've had asthma since I was a little, a little kid, even as an infant, I got hospitalized with asthma. Um, and for a while, my asthma was, was okay. I didn't even really need my inhalers. And then I started noticing on the treadmill at the gym, I was just walking and even just a walk at around, you know, three miles an hour after five minutes, I'd be like, man, I, I feel like I'm running a marathon. What is happening here? You know, so I'd hit my inhalers and they wouldn't really do anything. So I knew for a little while something was, was wrong, but I didn't know what, I just thought maybe my asthma was getting worse. Right. 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 Um, but anyway, I don't want to jump the gun on the whole story here, but yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, my, my life was very normal, 30 year old, uh, enjoying life, working and, and just uh, living life. So before you were diagnosed, Eric, did you have any idea that lung cancer was even a possibility of your medical issue? Was it even on your radar? No, I, you know, at that age, you know, to even hear something like cancer, you know, you, you hear, you hear the odd story of, you know, childhood cancers and yeah. other young people getting cancers, but especially not lung cancer, but not even cancer. I mean, it just wasn't on my radar. It was like, ah, yeah, I know when I'm 60, 70, 80, you know, right, so right. that's, that's the way a lot of us go. Right. And right. I just figured it was going to be normative, but uh, lung cancer was just, I, you know, I, I, did, I didn't smoke. Uh, I had smoked a little bit in, in high school, but you know, that, that was not something to, to get lung cancer as a smoker. You have to have many pack years for that to be the reason. And I know now for my doctors, that is not the cause of my cancer. There's a way that you can actually tell that if smoking caused your lung cancer and mine, mine was not caused by that. So, but I hadn't, I hadn't had any cigarettes at all in many, 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 many years. So it wasn't something that was on my radar at all. Um, and then uh, it, it popped up. Yeah. It was kind of like my, my male breast cancer. It wasn't on my radar either. And all of a sudden, you know, what, what well, are you talking about? You know, no, no one prepares you for that. No one, no one says to you and they don't sit you down at 18 in the doctor's office. It says, here's the thing. At some point in your life, you may get one of these cancers. Here's how you should react to it. Read this brochure. There's no way, like you, you don't get prepared. You can't prepare. Yeah. And why would you prepare for something that might not happen? Right. Right. But I kind of wish that they had, because there was, I had no idea what to do, obviously. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As I'm sure yeah. you did. Now, so, you know, you just uh, start freaking out, like, what's going on? Tell our audience, uh, we'll start with this, some of the first signs of lung cancer. What, what should they be looking for? Yeah, this is one of the harder things, right? Because by the time that you have symptoms, you're usually already at an advanced stage. That's the tricky thing about lung cancer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, skin cancer, you might see something, breast cancer, you might feel a lump, you know, right. all these things. But um, pancreas, lung, and brain are the three deadliest kind because they're found mostly late stage because of the because of the symptoms uh, are, are so late already by the time it's advanced. Um, that being said, you know, like I said, it, it was shortness of breath was was by far the the first one. Um, so after I had noticed that that you know the treadmill was getting harder for me, where my workouts were getting harder, I was just like, I'm getting older, my asthma's worse. I don't know, whatever. Uh, it was New Year's uh, of New Year's Eve into New Year's Day of 2012. Um, we had spent the night with a with a couple, um, a friend, some friends of ours, and I woke up that morning just completely unable to breathe. Like I mean, talking like it was like trying to suck air through a coffee straw, like a coffee stir. And I said, you know, something's wrong. I, I gotta I gotta get to the hospital and, and figure out if they can get me some new asthma medication or whatever. And so it's at that point that, um, you know, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she drives me to the hospital on New Year's Day. I go and I get x-rays and they say, yeah, you know, it looks like you've got a little bit of something going on in your lung, right? But the x-ray can't tell what it is. And we, we think you have walking pneumonia. Uh, so they said, here's some medication. This should clear up the pneumonia and send you on your way. You should be good. I said, okay, fine, cool. We'll do that. Yeah. yeah. So I start taking the medication to clear up the walking pneumonia. Lo and behold, a month, month and a half goes by. 
same problem. I just still can't fully catch my breath even just walking upstairs. Let me take a very brief moment out to alert all our patients and caregivers out there that rare patient voice, a supporter of the podcast, is paying for your input. Patients 16 years and older and caregivers, family and friends of any disability, disorder, syndrome, illness, or condition have the opportunity to express their opinions through surveys and interviews to improve medical products and services. Who knows your journey better than you? Rare Patient Voice puts you in touch with researchers who are developing products and services that can help you and others with your condition. These researchers need input of patients to develop products and services that have significant impact on patients' lives. Over the past nine years, Rare Patient Voice has paid patients over $10 million. When you join Rare Patient Voice, you may be invited to participate in interviews, surveys, or online communities where you will share your insights. Rare Patient Voice usually has hundreds of studies running at any time, so there are many opportunities to participate. You will earn $120 per hour for participating in these studies. By making your voice heard, you are a catalyst for change. Rest assured, your input will be used to help other patients like you. There is no cost at all to you, the participant. You can get more information and sign up by clicking the link in the sponsor's notes. So I go back to the doctors and I say, hey, you know, something else is going on here. Now, again, lung cancer is not on my radar. Why would it be? Um, right. In fairness to my doctors, lung cancer is not on their radar. Radar says, exactly. why would it be? Right. Exactly. Um, so then, so then they say, okay, walking pneumonia, maybe it's not that. We think you have a fungal fungal infection in your lung. So I say, okay, well, well, we'll try this. So they put me on an antifungal medication for another month or two, and as as we know now, that didn't work either. So we're wondering what's going on here. So finally, I go back. It's been about maybe three, three and a half months of misdiagnosis. And, you know, it, when it comes to lung cancer, this could be a big difference. And if you're going to live or well, you're losing time, you're losing yeah. time. Exactly. Exactly. And so again, I, I don't necessarily blame them for not assuming that's what it was, but man, do I wish they had been more aggressive up front because it may have been a difference in staging. Let me ask you a question. Let me yeah. stop you for a minute. Yeah, sure, sure. Looking back on it, if you had to do it all over again, would you, would you have gotten a second or third opinion? Uh, I did after I knew it was lung cancer, but yeah. um, I mean, before that, I, even before the second or third opinion, I probably would have pushed them harder. I would have said, I want a biopsy. I want a needle biopsy to determine what's going on here because that's eventually what happened. Right. 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 So it was after the fungal infection medication failed that they said, we don't know what's happening. They put in a big needle through my back. Uh, and took a sample and they determined, hey, you got lung cancer. And, you know, that's obviously when when the world fell apart. And yeah, you, you know how that feels. So. Oh, yeah. Now, now, uh, getting back to those signs of lung cancer, tell me if I'm right or wrong. I, I, I wrote down a few that I thought were, were important. Uh, obviously, shortness of breath, but were you, were you getting any coughing, any hoarseness, any bone pain? Uh, losing weight without trying or coughing up blood or anything like that? See, that that's the tricky thing about it. I didn't really get any of that. I had a little, with the shortness of breath came a little bit of pain just from trying to like, you know, huff and puff and actually breathe in. So I had some like bronchial throat pain, um, but it was so subtle. It was so subtle. It's like I could have missed it for another month or two um, if I hadn't had that one really severe reaction on, on New Year's Day. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I wish that I had more that I could tell people other than I kind of just trusted my doctors at the time knew what they were doing. Right. So I just assumed, okay, well, we're going to follow this course of action and it'll be all fine. The one thing that I can tell people is be your own advocate. Right. If you don't feel good, if you don't feel right, don't just take no for an answer. Don't just have someone say, ah, it's probably this and send you home. Say, right. uh-uh. You work for me as my doctors. You're my team of doctors that has to take care of me. I want more than this. I don't just want to gamble on my life. I know that now. I had no idea to ask for that and right. advocate for that then. So right. And the same thing happens with male breast cancer. These guys, they let stuff slide. And by the time they get in there, uh, because it's not on their radar and, and they're not even thinking about that. And you know, cancer is so subtle, it just I mean, with, with, with breast cancer, you can, you can be running a marathon, you know, 
it, it just doesn't stop you like like lung cancer does. Uh, well, and, and, and let me and let me put it this way too. Here's some of the challenges that's not related to the doctor or the diagnosis at all. It's the insurance, right? Yeah. So so if I have uh, lung cancer, an X-ray doesn't really determine it. You might be able to determine it with an MRI, a CT. Or a, or a PET scan, right? But right. the only way to know for sure to get that needle biopsy sample is to do the biopsy. Right. So for someone who's a traditionally healthy 30-year-old who shouldn't have lung cancer, no insurance in the world is just going to even go, even if a doctor says, hey, I want to needle biopsy this guy, they're not going to clear it. It's not going to happen. And that's no. part of the problem is, you know, with insurance pushing back, there's not, you don't have much opportunity to catch this stuff early. Yeah. Like insurance is a big, is a big hurdle. What are some of the causes for our audience out there of, of lung cancer? Uh, what, what are some of the major causes? Well, the major one that everyone knows about and hears about is smoking, right? right. So this can be, uh, you know, obviously this is like a lifetime thing. You don't smack, you don't smoke one pack when you're 18 and get lung cancer, but uh, you know, 30 pack years, 40 pack years. This is why we actually did some advocating, uh, some work I did with some advocacy groups in Washington. Um, to, to lower that age for CT scans, for preventive CT scans for people who have 30 pack years and are over 65. So if you do have 30 pack years and you're over 65 or you're a veteran, go get your CTs. They should be covered by insurance. And this is a way that I've met a few people who have caught their lung cancer in stage one from wow. these preventative scans. I mean, it's huge. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not in the category that that could have benefited, but for the people it can, uh, you know, they should absolutely be doing that. Um, the other thing is radon. I don't know if you've heard of radon. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a gas that naturally leaks out of the ground. Some areas of the country have it more than others. Um, the Midwest particularly does have a lot more. And you can get a radon, radon mitigation system installed in your house, which it's basically a pipe that, uh, that they drill into the ground of the foundation of your home and it gets the radon gas out of your house. Um, but you shouldn't be breathing that stuff in. So people that have lived in a radon filled home for most of their lifetimes, that can also uh, contribute to lung cancer. Now, those are the two main factors that we do know about. Here's the tricky thing. We don't know a lot of other fa factors. We can be environmental. Uh, we know that it can be toxicity. Um, like I know that I lived in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina for a hot minute in the early 2000s. There's that Camp Lejeune, if you've seen on TV. Camp oh, Lejeune. Yeah. Very uh, familiar with it. Right. So there's toxicity that's spilled into some of the watersheds um, that can cause all kinds of different cancers. I, I, so I was out of that time frame that they say for the yeah. lawsuit. But what are the coincidence of me non smoking, getting lung cancer, and also just happening to live in Jacksonville, North Carolina for a while? I don't know. No, we can't prove anything. We can't say it. But these, the toxicity in in a lot of our food and our air and our water, it's it's a big reason aside of climate change to clean that stuff up so we stop getting people sick. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I guess we should probably mention asbestos exposure. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Asbestos also. So you know, really traditionally, any inhaled toxin, right? You can, you can develop mesothelioma, COPD. Um, this happens a lot with, you know, people who are doing, doing jobs in coal mines and breathing in toxic dust all the time. So it, it really is important if you're surrounded in a workshop, let's say by any, any kind of dust at all during your work that you wear the proper filtration and masks, because it's just not, your body just can't get all that stuff out of your lungs. Yeah, which leads me into my next question. Uh, what steps can we do to minimize our risk, even though we ultimately can't prevent getting lung cancer? And, you know, like obviously stop smoking, yep. uh, avoid secondhand smoke, yep. test the home for radon and asbestos. Uh, and like you said, take precautions uh, at work around uh, toxic chemicals and carcinogens. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and, so, and you know, yeah. the, the, the preventative measures is, is for the people that qualify. Uh, that's the way to save lives because again, you can't see this thing and you often don't have the symptoms until late stage. So I can't stress enough the, the importance of getting scanned uh, when you qualify for it, obviously with insurance. So. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I guess we covered this. What, what prompted you to seek the medical help? And, and once diagnosed, uh, what did the doctor tell you uh, your prognosis was and, and how did you fare from the surgery? How, how did that all come about? 
Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take you to the to the phone call I got. So the phone call I got when I was working at the school in Berkeley, um, which was uh, uh, Bethel Nursery School. I was teaching there at the time. Um, and the teachers and families there were so supportive. I mean, they really, they, they set up a meal train for me and, and donated to, to help me through that time, which I, I was so grateful for because, you know, as a preschool teacher, you don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and sure, and, yeah, obviously, yeah. And, so they were, they were really wonderful. And I was very lucky to have that community at the time. Um, but I got a call, you know, when I was on my lunch break and, uh, you know, the doctor basically just said, hey, you've got cancer. So uh, next week we're going to have someone call you so you can come in next week and get your radiation started, your chemotherapy started. You're going to meet with the surgeon to find out what he's going to do. And meanwhile, I'm like, wait, what did, what did you just say? And I'm doing what next week? And, and, just, doesn't, and, and doesn't this amaze you? I mean, they're talking to you on the phone. It's not like, uh, yeah. Yeah, what are you doing? Maybe could you call us back? We want some, we have something important to talk to you about. I mean, there was none yeah. of that. There was none of that, huh? No, and, and, and exactly. And I'm like, I, you know, I hang up and I'm kind of ghost white and just in a state of shock. And I'm supposed to go back in the classroom with my kids that I'm, that I'm teaching there. And so I, you know, I tell my co-teachers about it and they say, oh my gosh, you know, go talk to the director. I tell the director and they, they knew something was going on that I was getting, you know, going to the doctor to see what was, why yeah. I wasn't feeling well. And to, to the director's credit at the time, she said, go home right now. Like, just go. Like, we've got the kids. You need to go take care of yourself. And so, um, so it was very fast. Like I said, I got more calls. I got calls from radiology and, and uh, oncology right away to set me up. I started, I think, later that week with treatment. So I did uh, six weeks of radiation to my chest, um, to my left lung where they had found the, the tumor that was about the size of a quarter in my left lung. And, uh, I did, I believe it was six rounds of chemotherapy, um, for cisplatin and, and etoposide. So, um, the plan was to put me through that regimen to shrink the growth of the cancer before we could even try to do the surgery to see if we can get everything out because I was already diagnosed at stage three, a, which to people that don't know, stage 3A lung cancer means you have a tumor that was localized, but there's been uptake of that cancer in your lymphatic system, meaning the superhighway of your body, meaning that it could essentially travel anywhere else. But at that time, we had only seen it in the, the, the one tumor, and then some of the lymph nodes were lighting up on the scans. Okay, so they figured that it wasn't metastatic. That well, that is metastatic. That is metastatic. I know, but it, did they... Did they, <laughs> did they uh, tested where they kind of knew it didn't, it didn't go anywhere else. It was kind of localized there. Yes. Because I, I had a side of the CAT scan, I had the, a PET scan and MRI. So lung cancer, when it, when it turns stage four, traditionally likes to go to the brain. It just yeah. travels basically straight to the brain. So we didn't see anything there. And so we were like, okay, we think it's just localized in the chest and the lymph, lymph nodes here. Um, so that was our best bet at the time. Obviously, like, uh, you know, medicine has progressed a little bit. So um, survival rates for lung cancer are getting better. But at that time, um, I remember being told, you know, even with all the treatments, right. my, my odds of survival was about 4%. I had about a 4% chance to live another five years. Wow. After all of this, right? Wow. <clears throat> and think about that. I'm 30. So... I'm kind of being told, you know, you most likely will have to get your affairs in order by 35. That's it. And I was like, so I haven't, haven't been married at the time. Didn't buy a house. Hadn't really advanced in the career that I wanted. Didn't have kids. Like all these milestones that we take for granted in life, I didn't hit. And I was like, I guess I'm just not going to do those things. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a very hard time for me. I was very depressed uh, after hearing all of that because um, you know, how do you cope with that? And I knew no one else that had been through it at the time. Um, so it felt very lonely. Um, but to get back to the, to the actual, uh, diagnosis and all that. So I, I actually handled chemo and radiation very well. Um, I lost my hair. I was very fatigued. I'd take like three hour long naps during the day, but I didn't have a lot of the symptoms. I was so lucky not to have the skin burns that people get with radiation. Yeah. I was lucky with that too. Yeah. yeah. And I was, and I was very lucky that the chemo didn't really make me throw up or anything. I, I was, I did about as well as you could expect. Um, but then the, the surgery came and, uh, I, I don't mince words when I say it was the hardest thing I've ever lived through by far. 
by I far. I can imagine. It was, it was an, an eight hour surgery uh, wow. where they basically opened up my back and they removed, they cut out half of my left lung and, and a bunch of the lymph nodes that had lit up. And, uh, you know, I, I wake up and was completely out of it. You know, I mean, you're, you're so drugged up after those procedures. I didn't really know where I was. I was kind of aware that people were around me, but you're like kind of in and out for about the first 24, 48 hours. And uh, they had an epidural in me um, so that I wouldn't feel anything basically below the neck. Um, but what happened is three days in, the well, so and also I'm waking up with these tubes coming out of my chest, right? I have two drainage tubes. Yeah, just yeah. Been down that road too. Yeah. And I, you know, you you look like a science experiment. You just oh, picked yeah. up the tubes and, and stuff. And then and, they uh, got you in a, a very uncomfortable gown on top yeah. of all that. Yeah. 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 It's it, it wasn't the vacation I wanted, let me tell you. No, <laughs> so, no, for sure. Um, but so you know, I I end up there were some friends visiting, and all of a sudden I'm just in just excruciating pain out of nowhere. And the, like, again, turn ghost white. I, I'm in so much pain that I can't speak. And what had happened was my epidural had slipped out. Oh. So all the meds that were keeping me pain free just ended up being gone. And so what they ended up having to do, they couldn't put the epidural back in. So they had to remove the chest tubes. So they ended up removing the chest tubes, which um, the only way I can describe it is like, if your soul leaves your body, this is what that feels like because you've got about three feet of plastic tubing just in your chest and they don't, they just say, all right, bear down. And they yank you like a pull toy. And, uh, you know, that, that was, that was a come to Jesus moment for me, <laughs> just, uh, from a pain perspective. Sure. Sure. But that, that was, I was in the hospital for nine days after that on, on pain medication and being monitored until they said I was good enough to go home. And, I didn't, I didn't feel good enough to go home, but they sent me home anyway. Um, I think during that time, my exercise was mostly being helped by people just doing 50 paces down the hallway and then 50 paces back and then laying down again for a while. And that was all I could do. Now, mind you, <clears throat> I was, again, I was working out every day prior to this. I was benching close to 300 pounds at the time. I mean, I was really seriously trying to bodybuild. You're in good shape. Yeah. And, and so then I went from 300 pounds and, and running on the treadmill to, I can't walk on my own 50 feet, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. So it was really, that was a mental hurdle that was very hard to overcome. Um, and, uh, and I was lucky to have the support that I did at the time. My, my girlfriend, who's now my wife and, and friends who, uh, who were supporting me at the time too. So they pretty much gave you the power to push forward. They gave you some hope. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I think we'll probably get to this as we talk about some of the nonprofits that, that I've, uh, yeah. I've worked with over the years, but uh, a friend uh, that I knew from Berkeley, she had another friend who, who was diagnosed with lung cancer at a, at a young age, at I think 2020, I believe, um, Jill Costello, um, who passed from lung cancer. And she was a, a athlete on the crew team at, at UC Berkeley many years ago. So I just happened to know a friend of hers um, who put uh, Bonnie Adario in contact with me. Bonnie Adario at the time had run the Bonnie J. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. She's a survivor herself. So she called me out of the blue after I was recovering. And uh, again, I was, I was really down at the time in tons of pain, you know, had been told there's no hope. She lit the fire of hope in me because she said, don't listen to any of that stuff. There is hope. You will survive this. Let's figure it out. Let's do everything we can. Let's get you genetic testing, which I hadn't heard about genetic testing at all until she had told me about it, which I think was a big failure on the, on the side of the doctors and hospitals, because now we know if you get that genetic testing, there are certain drugs that can help you. Yeah. Um, if, if you need them, I luckily I haven't needed them yet at my, in my life, but I know that I have an EGFR mutation and can utilize certain drugs at the time. So she opened all these avenues of like, you can survive this. There are other options. This is not all. Don't worry about that 4%. And that was the first time that I really breathed a sigh of relief and said, I can do this. And um, so there's been other things since then, but she was really the, the flagship of my hope at the time. Thank God for her. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. You said they took, how many lymph nodes did they take? Well, that first time, I think they probably took about 20. And then my recurrence in 2019, which I'm sure we'll get to, but they took eight then. Did you ever have lymphedema from that? Mm -mm. Nope. You're lucky. 
I know. They took they took nine. Well, they took a couple for the first time from me, and then they took nine, and I developed it. So I mean, you can yeah. see I'm still. Yeah, I, I'm. I I had surgery on it, and uh, they did actually can do a lymph node transplant these days. Oh well. Wow. Uh, they took it out of my belly and put it in my forearm. So this is, even though it looks not so hot. Uh, we're on the road to recovery. I'll, I'll probably just be in a sleeve and I won't be in, you know, bandaging. But anyway, enough about me. How did your life change after that diagnosis? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, um, I think that for first year, it was really just about the recovery. Uh, when I tell you that surgery, just, you know, the chemo and radiation, I would, I would do that every day, every of, of the week for the rest of my life <laughs> compared to that surgery. And yeah. so it took a full year um, to really get back to myself after that surgery. Um, I didn't start working out again, I think, until about nine months in um, to the recovery, and I didn't feel well enough, and I still had nerve damage. So the whole center of my chest here, I just I couldn't feel it. It was, it was just dead. Um, and the nerves have come back over time. I still have a little spot in the middle that I, when I poke, I can't really touch or feel. Yeah. Uh, but it, I was also on opioids. I was on oxycodone. And, and morphine, high levels of it for so long um, that I had withdrawal symptoms when coming down from that too. So when I did come off of the opioids, finally, I was sweating through my sheets for two weeks and, and suicidally depressed. And I knew that it was the opioids. It wasn't, it wasn't me. And that's what got me through that. But it was really like a, a grit your teeth and bear it kind of, kind of uh, process to get through it. But once I was through that, I, I was like, okay, so if I'm going to live this life, if I'm planning on living more than the five years, what do I want? So I ended up switching careers. I went from teaching preschool to get a job uh, at working in tech. Um, so I work for Square now, the credit card readers that you. you oh, yeah. yeah. I use them myself. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So so I do instructional design for them now. But uh, I, at the time I was I was doing phone support, uh, you know, helping the folks that call in and, and need some help. So I, I wanted to just shift my career to something else, see what else I could achieve. I wanted to get married. So the thing that my wife said to me when I told her that night, um, when she came home from work, I said, hey, they told me I have lung cancer. The way she responded, she said, we're getting married. That's how she responded. It's the first thing she said. You know, so, she loves you. You know, yeah, she loves you. Yeah. I was like, well, she doesn't get any better than that. No, no. I was like, she's going to put up with me. So, uh, yeah. you know, so we, we uh, ended up getting married. So we got married then a few years after that. Um, and then, you know, I've advanced my career. I wrote my book. We moved to Colorado, bought a house, have two children. So it's like, I, I took that adversity from lung cancer that they had said, you know, your chances here are not so good. And I flipped it on its head. I said, if my chances aren't good, I'm going to live the hell out of this life. I'm going to, there, there's nothing that I'm not going to do. And so that's why I did all these things. That's why I wrote this book. Not everyone can just sit down and write a 600 page book. No. And I said, what's the other, the other option is not to do it. And I said, that's not an option. I want to achieve the pinnacle of what this life has to offer. I don't want to lay on my deathbed someday and leave anything on the table. If it's something right. I can achieve, I want to do it. Absolutely. Let's briefly talk about 2019. You have a recurrence. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd been getting my, my regular scans um, because we just assumed this thing was going to come back and we'll have to deal with it. But then 2013 to 2019, that's a long period of time. Six the, years, yeah. Yeah, with the advanced stage lung cancer I had, most people don't even continue getting scans at that point. They just say, yeah, you're good to go. Enjoy your life. Bye-bye. Yeah. And uh, that's we were actually going to do that. This was my very last CT that we were going to do because I was getting them every three months and then every six months. And we were just going to say, you're good. Sayonara. And we, yeah. And this one last CT – you know, my oncologist said, had said, something looks a little weird. They said, it's not, not much, but there's some little lights hopping up in the middle of your chest that they shouldn't be, and they weren't before. They said, we can either just wait it out, do another scan, or we can do some more scanning and PTs, uh, PET scans and a bronchoscopy to see uh, what this is. So I said, let's not play around with it. <laughs> let's just right. figure it out Right. Right. And so that's that's what we did. And it determined that the cancer had come back in those lymph nodes in the middle of my chest. So uh, this time around, I was obviously more prepared. I was like, I've been through this. I, right. I wasn't down at all. I was like, 
very matter of fact, like, let's get it done. I basically, I, I told my oncologist, I said, if you can wheel me into surgery right now, I'll go now. Like, let's do it. Right. Right. Uh, obviously they didn't, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and that time was, was faster and easier because a, they didn't have to remove half a lung. So I didn't have to have that eight hour long surgery. Yeah. Uh, B, I didn't have to do radiation and chemo. They thought my surgeon who was wonderful at the time, at the time, um, who I trusted emphatically, uh, from the first time around, <clears throat> you know, he had said to me, we're going to get this. We're going to cure you. Like the first time he said it too, we're going to cure you and you're going to live your life. We're going to get it done. And I said, I, I believe you, I trust you. And so we just did the surgery. We, we did, uh, obviously I was out, but it was a laparoscopic surgery. They went in through my other side this time with scopes. They snipped out eight mediastinal lymph nodes in the middle of my chest. And of those eight, only, I believe two came back with cancer after they had been tested. So um, we were very lucky in that regard. It was about a three month recovery process there instead of a year long recovery this time. Um, and ever since I've been, scans have been clear and I've been healthy and I'm in the best shape of my life and feel good. So I'm very grateful. So you had no chemo, no radiation. It just took Not it out. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So Eric, what are your thoughts on the perception that lung cancer is a smoker's disease and is the disease somewhat stigmatized by society? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean without question, right? Uh, my my face at 30 years old, I might I might have a little more gray hairs now at, at 40. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm the face of young lung cancer. I've met other people now with young lung cancer uh, and you know, there aren't many of us, but it happened. It happens and we need to figure out why we need to figure out the treatments to solve it. And lung cancer specifically has been a field that's been helping other cancers too. There have been huge leaps in the medications and treatments that people have been able to, to take to extend their lives with lung cancer now. But that doesn't happen without funding. And that's why I've gone to Washington multiple times with the GoTo Foundation to advocate for lung cancer research and funding. If we don't get those government dollars, that's where the big chunk of that funding money comes people are losing their lives every day, every day losing their lives because we're not, we don't have the urgency about this problem. And part of it is because of that stigma that it's a smoker's disease, right? Right. <laughs> Nobody deserves cancer. We know no. this. Right. But often when somebody says they have lung cancer, the first question is, well, did you smoke? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, my response to that is, well, who cares? <laughs> right. Right. So what? So they smoked, even if they smoked or didn't smoke, that doesn't matter. They have cancer and they don't deserve to die because of it, right? Right. So that stigma is what we're trying to push against. And that's why I wanted to show my face in Washington, D.C. as, hello, this is not just a smoker's disease. It's not just 65 and plus. There are a lot of other people getting this and we need to have the urgency that we had about COVID-19, right? Right. Uh, we have a lot of urgency about that. And that's now, you know, I'm not going to say finished and done with, but more controlled, we still are losing 250,000 people annually to lung cancer. That's a wow. lot. Wow, that's a lot of people. Yeah, it's a lot of people. So, yeah, 250,000. So, that's in the United States. Uh, I don't want to quote that exactly because I don't have the, the data on hand, but I okay. believe so. Yes. Wow. So lung cancer screen is available, but compared to breast, colon, and prostate cancer that has a 70% screening rate, lung cancer is six is at 6%, as well as the research funding. Again, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on screening and genetic testing for lung cancer? Yeah, I mean, the funding, the funding per deaths, if you look at this data, again, I, I can't quote it exactly because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the funding per death for lung cancer is much lower than any other cancer. Uh, and, it, and like an absurd amount of, of money goes to like, let's say malaria. I think there were six deaths. There was in one year, six deaths from malaria in the US and it was funded, I think something like 200 times more per death than lung cancer, right? So when you look at the per capita funding, that's what we should be looking at and funding more of. So uh, it needs to be funded more. Um, Washington needs to get serious about it. I want to see more people in the medical community getting serious about it because the news flash is this disease is going to affect someone you know someday if it hasn't already. It's going to affect you. 
or it could let's break away from the podcast for a moment to tell you about a great program available for those needing relief from muscle tension and joint tightness the course is hyperbolic stretching the science of muscle geometry and reflexes discover the eight minute flexibility and mobility routines that can relieve your muscle tension and joint tightness in the next 30 days regardless of your age body type or current physical condition this program has been enjoyed by over 750,000 beginners and athletes worldwide. Splits, forward bends, back bends, full squats, and the ability to interlace your fingers behind your back are displays of natural range of motion we all had as infants but lost it for various reasons over time. There are many causes of muscle stiffness, ranging from lack of physical activity, incorrect way of sitting or standing, hard physical work, and heavy strenuous exercise. Unfortunately, sooner or later, muscle stiffness often manifests as pain, especially in the neck, lower back, spine, shoulders, or hips. Proper stretching is the best non-invasive solution that can help you get back to living a pain-free life. What's more, it can even get you in great shape so you can restart your active life. This science-based stretching program doesn't require more than eight minutes per day, and it doesn't only develop your flexibility, but your muscular strength as well. You can save a lot of time with this program because there is no need to travel to gyms or yoga studios. You can follow the program while watching TV or listening to your favorite music. Here's some facts you didn't know. You'll gain more flexibility when you train your central nervous system instead of merely trying to stretch your muscles. Stretching the same muscle every day can actually decrease your flexibility. Three times a week is optimal frequency. Some of the main benefits you enjoy from this program are reduced stiffness and tension, improved posture, improved circulation, reduced post-workout soreness, improved sleep, better running, cycling, and golf, reduced back, hip, and leg pains, increased bladder and bowel control, and injury prevention. This program offers a 60-day money-back guarantee if for any reason you aren't happy with the course. The program sells for the unbelievably low price of $27, and you get lifetime access to the program. Click the link in the podcast notes for more detailed information about the course and to order it. Affect a family member or a loved one. We need to solve it now. And some of these treatments are, are going to be fixing uh, and solving it for people. I've talked to more than one oncologist who said they've gotten into this field of lung cancer oncology because they believe we're at a point where we're at a tipping point to solve this problem, that we're going to be able to, in our lifetime, solve lung cancer. But again, it won't happen without that funding. So that's where we've got to get real serious about it. And as far as the genetic, te genetic testing goes, I think everyone should get genetic testing cancer. Uh, if you've been diagnosed, ask for it right away because you might, you might have more treatment options off the bat uh, if you do. Um, like I know Tegriso, because I have an EGFR mutation, that's a, a pill that I could be taking to extend my life someday if I'm no longer operable, if chemo and radiation and surgery is no longer an option. So why, why not do it? Why not have right. that extra card in your pocket to, to do it? Right. Right. As you went through the treatment and healing process, uh, what tips or advice do you have for others out there to get through it? Well, first and foremost, um, you got to be kind to yourself because it's a long road and it's very hard. Um, <clears throat> know that it's a marathon and not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Um, know that you got to take it day by day, lean on your people, whether it's family, friends, community, it's not something you can do alone. And a lot of people are, I don't want to say scared, but they don't know what to do, right? They don't know how to support you. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell all those friends and family members and caregivers, just spend time with your people, right? The best thing that anyone could do for me as I was going through treatment or recovering from surgery was sitting with me. Spend time with me, talk to me about something that isn't cancer because I trust you. I believe me, this is the only thing on your mind most of the time. So right. if you talk to me about TV, books, movies, normal stuff, that's yeah. what you need. That's what you need. And someone to spend time with you as you go to your appointments, when you get your chemo, I had some, some friends and family come and sit with me. And that was great because I wasn't just alone there having poison drip into my arm, right? Yeah. Which is very, uh, a very scary prospect. So, yeah. um, that's what I would say about that. And also um, advocating for yourself to get the best treatment possible and taking someone with you to appointments because you're so in your head about this stuff and on all kinds of medications, you're not going to remember everything. It's really important to have someone with a notepad yeah. or 
information to, to help you advocate for yourself and ask the questions that you're going to forget. What prompted you to be vulnerable and share your story to others? I like to smash taboos. <laughs> uh, this good, is really good. Yeah, this is related to my book a little bit too, but I think we're too secretive about the pain in our lives. And I think that because of that, people feel alone and suffer with their pain in silence. So the reason I say this stuff is because now I want other people going through it to see that I'm doing well, that I've survived it, that I've gotten through and can reach out to me for help. I've talked to plenty of people over the years who were diagnosed since I was that were scared and didn't know what to do. And I was able to help them with my story and help give them some guidance. And if I can help anyone with that, that's meaningful to me, right? So I don't wanna be scared of, I don't wanna be scared of putting myself out there and, and, and being secretive about it. There's no reason for that. I wanna be vocal. I want people to know this is the human experience. We're all in yeah. this together and right. we need to help each other. Yeah, I don't know where the secrecy came from, but I know back, Back in the day, back in the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, people were, they just didn't talk about their illnesses. Right. They just kept it, kept it bottled up. Tell us about your advocacy work regarding lung cancer and what nonprofits or organizations have you worked with or are working with? Yeah, I've, I've worked with and been in touch with, with a lot of different organizations, but I, I think the two that I have to mention here, that one I mentioned already is GoTo Foundation. Uh, the go-to foundation for lung cancer research and advocacy they are the ones that i've gone to washington dc with multiple times um, they set it up every year where there's a summit of survivors we storm we storm uh, the capitol we talk to senators representatives we show them the data we show them the figures we show them our faces and our stories and we tell them why it's so important to fund this research um, we've had great success with that in the past I'm unfortunately missing it this year um, because I'm going to have my, my son born in April. Yeah. Um, it's a blessing, but I wish that I could be there in person, but I know there's going to be plenty of people doing it. If you have been affected by lung cancer, if you've had it or have a family member who's had it, or you've been a caregiver, please, please, please go be a part of this advocacy work they do because the more faces that show up, the more funding we can get for this and save more lives. It really is impactful and I've seen it work. Um, so that's on that side. They, the GoTo Foundation also has uh, wonderful resources. If you need to talk to someone, they have a hotline. They have a whole handbook of things that you can learn about and research and, uh, and um, you know, everything that has to do with lung cancer. So definitely utilize them as that resource. The other foundation that I work with is Project Koru. So Project Koru is uh, basically a foundation that takes young adult cancer survivors and patients on outdoor excursions. These excursions are essentially, um, like the one I went on was surfing in Maui. They do trips in Costa Rica. They do trips in uh, Oregon um, for skiing in the winter. But this is a way to get people between 18 and 40 back out into the world after cancer. Or even still, I've been with people on trips um, who are in treatment and they're standing up on a surfboard and getting back to life. And that's the important thing. That's what I felt was missing when I got diagnosed. I was like, I am alone. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what I'm capable of anymore. And this organization gives that back to these young adult survivors that are going through this, gives them that sense of community, that sense that I can do hard things still, that my body is still capable, that there's still a lot of life left to live. Um, and, and I've actually just recently in the past year, uh, I'm now a counselor with Project Koru. So I'm going to give back to that community by taking some of these uh, some of these young survivors on these trips and excursions in the future. So I haven't gotten to do that yet, but I'm very, very much looking forward to it. And it's a wonderful organization. Eric, how do you spell Koru? Uh, K-O-R-U. And I can give you the website for it, for, for both, actually. So um, the website for uh, GoTo Foundation is just goto.org, G-O, the number two, dot org. And Project Koru is Project Koru. Um, and that's K-O-R-U dot org. Okay. For anybody out there who might want to donate to it or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, Always looking for donations. And especially after, after uh, COVID, um, it's been, it's been hard to get funding. So if you, if you have some money to spare, please, please donate. Yeah. And you know, there's nothing better. I, I, it sounds weird, but when you're around people who've gone through what you've gone through, and you talk to them, uh, there's an automatic bonding. Like it's, it's almost like a family member. 
That is a family member. It is. I mean, because it you is. can, there, there's nobody else. I mean, yeah, you have your supporters, but there's nobody else that can understand you better than somebody who's gone through it. Yeah. Yeah. And Project Koru, actually, we call uh, the alumni are called Ohana, which is which is family. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you're part of this family. And the way that I say it is like when you talk to someone else, a young person, especially when you are a young person that's been through cancer and you talk to someone about it, you can start halfway through the book. Right. You don't have to try to explain. And it was kind of like this. And it's very hard to explain that context unless you live it. Yeah. But you can start with someone else who's been through it at chapter 25 and not miss a beat, and you can immediately relate. And that's really helpful. Right. Now, being a two-time cancer survivor myself, I've heard the phrase, cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. Not that I wish it upon anybody, but how has cancer changed you as a person? <laughs> uh, cancer is the shits. <laughs> right, right. I actually... Uh, I would never say, uh, you know, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me, right? It, I, I wish it didn't happen to me, but the lessons learned through it were invaluable. The, like I said before, the, the fortitude to push through and achieve hard things, to hit those milestones in life uh, when I didn't think they'd be possible. So the thing, the way that I look at cancer now, I see it as this hurdle I had to get through to understand how precious life is and that I could actually achieve anything. There was nothing stopping me in this life other than me, other than me. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to hit all those goals and measures. So uh, do I wish that I had cancer? No. Of course. Were not. the lessons I learned valuable? Absolutely. Now you've just written your first book. It's a novel, I believe, entitled All the Brutal Pieces. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. Uh, this is, I wouldn't say it's related to my survivorship of cancer, but it is in so far as I had the story that I wanted to tell. Um, I've, I've always been a fan of noir, right? So noir movies, noir books, and pulp thrillers, um, <clears throat> which can be a uh, trigger warning for anyone that wants to check the book out. There is a heavy amount of violence and childhood trauma. Those are themes throughout the book. So just want to put that out there because that's not everybody's style. But Aside of the cancer stuff, and, and this is something I've never been as public about, which I, I'm open about now because I wrote about it, but I've lived through childhood trauma myself, um, some abusive situations, neglectful situations. And that was more private to me than cancer was. I actually went to adult survivors of child abuse meetings for a few years to kind of work through these issues that had, that had come up in my life because of that. Um, I even became a human development major and family study major in college, became a preschool teacher, right? Because I kind of wanted to give kids the childhood that I didn't get. I wanted to be able to provide that for them. So this book focuses a lot on that. Some stories in it, some, some of the trauma that the kids go through in this did happen to me. I don't want to say that it's a memoir. It is not. It is definitely a book of fiction, but I used real uh, situations and stories in the book to, to ground it in reality. So the story is uh, essentially this vigilante anti-hero named Caleb. <clears throat> he goes around the country and he saves abused children um, from, from homes where they've slipped through the cracks of the system that's meant to protect them, which after talking to many um, child advocates who actually work in this field, I've had, I think, four child advocates uh, read the book now, and they've said it was extremely impactful and true to life, even though it's a work of fiction that these are problems, that these kids are being left behind by a system that cannot help them. And so I created this, uh, this guy who's likable and you can agree with what he does saving these kids if you can't agree with the murders that he actually, uh, that he actually does to save these children, right? So that's the whole part of the anti-hero bit where you, you can relate to someone like that, but you can't necessarily be like, well, he's doing the right thing, right? But it's also in that it's a story of found family. It's a story of healing from trauma, and the main character has to face that himself. Uh, why does he do the things he does? Um, he has to struggle with panic attacks throughout the story and doesn't really connect those things. Like he doesn't, he's pretty shut off from his own childhood trauma, um, even though he does this work, right? So in the end, it's, you know, hopefully, and my early readers have really enjoyed it and found this to be true, but it's a story of redemption and it's a story of found family at its core. And, and, uh, the violence is, is part of it, but that's not the main, the main reason for the story. 
I take it the book's available on Amazon? Yeah, so uh, available on Amazon. Um, it's also on Apple Books, uh, Barnes & Noble, Google Play. So I have my website, erickkhale.com. All the links are there. Um, but paperback and ebook on Amazon is, is the way most people are getting it. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll feature that in the podcast notes. And we'll also feature it on our Facebook group. Love it. Thank you. you so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the yeah. first time author, it's hard to get your name out there. And yeah, we'll put it out there. Absolutely. Yeah, we do that for all our guests. Uh, do you have any plans for future work uh, after after this book? Any new yeah, books? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so uh, all the brittle pieces, and I'll, I have the book right here, actually. So I'll show it to you. All there, the okay. Pieces, that's it. Um, and this is actually book one in the Forgotten Children series. So I am halfway through the manuscript of book number two, and I hope to... Uh, have that finished, edited, and available later this year. So we'll see how that goes with the new baby on the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, writing a book's hard. I know that. Uh, for those out there struggling with life issues uh, and challenges, what advice do you have for them out there to overcome? A, I think as we've just discussed, talk about it. I think that people do a great disservice not speaking about their hardships, uh, not leaning on others right? If you can't talk to your family, if you can't talk to your friends, talk to counselors, talk to therapists, uh, even include in the book because there is trauma issues, um, the, the website for adult survivors of child abuse meetings, for uh, RAIN, for um, any hotlines, the National Suicide Hotline, like these are places that you can reach out to for help. But you need to be honest with yourself about it first because you can't start to heal until you can actually speak the words, I've lived through childhood trauma or I've lived through cancer and get that support. So don't deny it to yourself because you're denying yourself healing <clears throat> and lean on the people in your life um, that you can trust because you need that support. You cannot do any of this alone. It may feel like you can, but you won't come out the other side whole if you try it that way. Good advice. How can people contact you, Eric? Yeah, you can find me um, on my website. So Eric K. Hale, that's Eric with a K and then the middle initial K hail.com um, inquiries at erickhale.com is my email address, but you can also find links to my Facebook, my Instagram, and my Twitter on my website. I want to thank you so much, Eric, for opening up and, and sharing your journey uh, with us and educating us on the subject of lung cancer. Uh, I know that everyone listening to us today has taken away uh, much needed information that will be a benefit to them and their uh, friends and family members. I wish you nothing but good health going forward and good fortune in your advocacy and authoring endeavors. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Ron. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, love listening to your podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, for those out there who have comments and suggestions, you can email me at it's a wrap with rap at gmail.com. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. Facebook group, uh, and page is It's a Wrap with Rap. Instagram, It's a Wrap with Rap podcast, and all the episodes on YouTube, It's a Wrap with Rap, the podcast uncut. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Please stay safe for now. And for now, It's a Wrap. <laughs>